And I want to welcome you to the City Church. If you've never been here before, my name's Clayton Walker. I'm the pastor here. And if it's your first time joining us, you're a guest, man, we are honored that you're here. If you would go on our website, thecitylbk.church on your phone, you can do that right now. Uh, Fill out our connect form. Let us know that it's your first time here. We'd love to follow up with you and chat with you about next steps if that's something you'd like to chat with. If you come here every week and there's something that God lays on your heart, uh, a next step that you want to take with God, that's the place to go to and let us know about what God's doing in your life. The citylbk.church and fill out that connect form. Well, we are starting a new series today and it will carry on for the next month, the next four weeks. It's called Friends. And in this series, we've invited some of our friends uh, to come and to share with us and to challenge us and to speak to us uh, about what is coming next for us this fall. Many of you guys know this fall, uh, we're launching our Sunday service. Uh, Raider church is going to be back. Our prison ministry is going to continue to, to grow. Our youth ministry is taken off. And so God is doing so much here in such a short time. And we've invited some people who've kind of been there and done that to come and to challenge us and to share with us. And so I'm so excited uh, about this series. I believe God's going to do uh, great things in our church through this series and through these guests that are going to come and, and share with us. Uh, just wisdom from their experience and from God's word uh, about what it looks like for us to take this next step and to go to the next level. And so I'm excited tonight. You're going to get to hear from Pastor Zach White and his wife, Amber White. Uh, They are here. Zach and I met in college uh, here at Wayland Baptist University. And um, chances are we skipped some classes together and uh, did a lot of other things together. But but, um, we met then and God has done great things in, in their lives since. In fact, he was telling me tonight that if it wasn't for meeting Amber when he was in college, he'd probably be in jail right now and we would be ministering to him at one of our campuses. But, but he met Amber and God did something in his life and saved Zach and rescued Zach. And so uh, since that time, he's planted a church though in San Antonio. And it's called Revolution Church, and they have been going for about 10 years now. And God has done tremendous things in and through their church. They've launched some prison campuses as well uh, in the area. And um, their church has grown to over 1,000 people in a short time. And so I'm excited uh, for you guys to get to hear from Pastor Zach. So would you guys help me welcome him to the city? Gotta do the hug. Gotta do the hug. (laughs) How are you, City Church? All right, I got to get kind of a feel for how y'all, how many of y'all believe church should be fun? Okay, good, good. I like a rowdy church, all right? So don't, you know, feel free to get up, run laps, whatever you want to do. Uh, just, I'm kidding, maybe not take it that far. I don't know what y'all do here, but um, Clayton, thank you so much for that introduction. I have known Pastor Clayton since college. Um, my wife's right here, stand up real quick. I like to show off my family. My kids are not here, but this is my wife, Amber. Um, about to celebrate 18 years of marriage, which is crazy to me. I just can't believe that. We grew up here in Lubbock and uh, are really pumped to be back in Lubbock tonight, not pumped about the dirt blowing <laughs> in the air, because that doesn't happen in San Antonio, y'all. So we, it's funny, to y'all, it's a normal day. Amber and I were like, let's go take a picture with the dirt. We were so excited and we'll take it back and that'll be in a sermon one day. You watch, it's coming, man. It is coming, I promise you. A um, little bit about our church real quick. 10 years old. Uh, we've baptized over 1,100 people in those 10 years. We've seen 3,500 people give their life to Christ. <clears throat> and I'm not bragging on me. I'm bragging on uh, the people. Because how many of you know church is not a building? Church is not an event. Church is not a service time that you go to. Church is you and me. In fact, turn to the person next to you and say, you're the church. Turn to the other side. You're the church. Look at the person behind you. I'm the church. Do the hokey pokey, we're the church. Never forget that, that primarily church is us, people, God's family, not a building, not an event, not a service, but us. And God's doing something really special. I don't know if you know how cool it is that you get to be a part of something from the ground up. When Clayton was telling me about what God's done in such a short amount of time and invited me to be a part of it, I immediately thought, of the book of Acts. So if you got a Bible, go to the book of Acts. Maybe you turn your Bible on with your cell phone, book of Acts, and I'm gonna meet you there in just a second. Um, 
We have a, a few things in common that he mentioned as churches. We also have some, some prison work we do, which is really cool, something I really love. Uh, both churches, I noticed, have very good-looking pastors. I noticed that. Um, <laughs> yours, the second best-looking pastor in Texas. Okay, so uh, God's done so much in, in 10 years, and, and I feel like he's really taught me uh, a little bit about a specific mindset that it takes to do what you guys are doing right now, long term. And that's what I wanna kinda of talk to you about tonight, is the mindset. Because every church has a mission, we all say it different, but it's about a biblical mandate to reach people who are far from God. We all know that. I mean, Jesus is just constantly hammering the disciples with it, right? They're getting distracted and he's like, guys, come on, I keep telling you, I'm here to fish for people, right? I'm here to make you fishers of men. I remember in Matthew when he says, follow me and I will make you, form you into fishers of men. He was always hammering that. So at Revolution Church, we say we got our mind on the mission and the mission on our mind. And that's what I wanna to talk to you about tonight is how you can have your mind on the mission and the mission on your mind. Um, in Hebrews chapter five, the Bible self-defines as spiritual meat, spiritual protein, okay? like the meat of scripture, right? Uh, that, that lean meat that we need to grow some spiritual muscle. And then in the book of John chapter six, Jesus says that he is the bread of life. Early on uh, as a Christian, I, I read those things and I put them together and, and kind of started seeing how in scripture, I think a table, I'm gonna use this table tonight and these chairs tonight, a table is a great representation of what church is supposed to be, what we're supposed to do together. The church is a table where every Wednesday night right now, soon on Sundays, you guys work together to serve up a big, beautiful biblical meal. Jesus, the bread of life, and his word, the spiritual meat, right? And in this church, you guys have a lot of seats. You have pews, which is cool. I heard at Easter you had seats because there were so many people, okay? But did you know in every church, there's a lot of seats, but there's only three chairs at the table. That's it, three chairs. How many of you remember musical chairs when you were a kid? What was the goal of the game musical chairs? The goal was to make sure you had a chair, right? If you didn't have a chair, you lose. Tonight I wanna to ask you one question and we're gonna kinda of think about it together. The question is this, which chair is my chair? Which chair is my chair? Just say it out loud with me. Which chair is my chair? All right, to answer that question, we're gonna to go to the book of Acts, chapter nine. The book of Acts is um, kind of the story of the first Christians a little over 2,000 years ago, putting the very first church together. And in chapter nine, specifically, there's this guy named Saul with an S. Eventually, Saul becomes Paul. Paul, y'all. I'm talking about Paul, probably the greatest Christian to ever walk the face of the earth other than Jesus himself. I'm talking about Paul, y'all, the guy that wrote almost half of the New Testament converted almost all of the known world at the time to Christianity. I'm talking about Paul, y'all, like one of the greatest missionaries of all time. Paul is in Acts chapter nine, and this is before he's a believer. In fact, when we meet Paul right here, he's still Saul. He's Saul the Hellraiser, I think is the best nickname for him, okay? It's in that context, let's read. It says in verse one, meanwhile, Saul was uttering threats with every breath and was eager to kill the Lord's followers. That's why I call him a Hellraiser. So he went to the high priest, okay? He goes to the religious people of the day because he subscribed to a religion. But how many of you know we do something different? It's all about a relationship. He went to the high priest. He requested letters addressed to the synagogues in Damascus asking for their cooperation in the arrest of any followers of the way that he found there. They didn't know what to call it back then. It wasn't called Christianity yet, but someone along the line just remembered, well, Jesus said he's the way. Let's just call it that. Let's just call this whole thing the way. And he wanted to bring them, both men and women. And this is one of those tiny little loaded phrases in scripture. I mean, think about that. He's not just trying to kill the men. He wants to get them all. Men, women, children, any followers of the way. And he wanted to bring them back to Jerusalem in chains. Again, he subscribes to a religion. Religion always change you. It says as he was approaching Damascus on this mission, a light from heaven suddenly shone down around him he fell to the ground and he heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Now, whose voice is this? This is the voice of the resurrected Jesus. 
Jesus is chasing down a hell-raising, maniacal, Christian-killing, pharisaical, religious dude that's just on this walk from Jerusalem to Damascus. And here's where we start to see the chairs. I wanna to talk to you about the chairs. Chair number one, and I don't necessarily like using labels. It's not my favorite thing to do, but for tonight, they're really gonna help us, okay? So if you're offended by one of these labels, I'm sorry, get over it. I don't have to come back here. All right, here we go. Chair number one, let's call the seeker. The seeker. And by the way, we use this language in our church quite a bit. And one time someone said, well, is this a seeker sensitive church? And our answer is no, this is a Jesus sensitive church. Amen, Pastor Clayton, right? We listen to Jesus, we follow Jesus. But it just so happens that as you study the life of Jesus, who we follow, he was primarily focused on this kind of person, the seeker person. That's chair number one. I'm talking about someone who does not know Christ. And I see this chair in this story because Jesus goes way out of his way to reach a seeker. That's our calling as the church. That's our calling as Christ followers. We always go way out of our way, whatever it takes to reach anyone in seat number one, the seeker seat. We have a biblical mandate. It is not an option to do whatever it takes to radically rescue people in this chair. There is always, always, always a chair for a seeker in the church. And, and listen, some of you here tonight, you might be going, oh dang, he's talking about me. Like that's me, because I'm not totally sure yet. I'm just kind of kicking the tires of this faith thing. I'm just kind of investigating the claims of, of, of Jesus, right? That might be you. And the heart of the church communicated in scripture to us, it's always that if that's you, seeker seat, chair number one, it doesn't matter what you were thinking when you walked in here, who you cussed at today, right? Who you slept with last night, what you drank, what you pumped into your veins. We have a place for you in the church because Jesus always had a place for you. If you're in that seeker seat, that's what we want you to hear. There is a place for you. And if you're breathing, and you're not sure what you think about this guy named Jesus or about faith, same deal goes for you. There is a seat for you. Because with Jesus, everyone's welcome, nobody's perfect, and anything's possible, period. With Jesus, it's always about guilt-free, graceful. With Jesus, it's always about making sure that we do not make it hard for somebody in this seat to get close to God. No, we make it as easy as possible, right? We share our stories, we pray for them, we do whatever it takes to rescue them. In the life and, and ministry of Jesus, we see that you can always belong before you even behave, right? You can belong before you even believe. So if you're like, oh, that's me, that seeker chair, that's what we want you to know. You can belong before you believe or behave because that's how Jesus rolled. He hung out with people who were so far from believing or behaving and just said, I just love you. I'm just here to give you a place to belong. So that's what we do in church. Now, what blows my mind in, in this story is that Saul was killing Christians and Jesus still made room for him. What does that take in church? It takes us always being very aware of this chair. See, here's what I know about your pastor's heart. Whenever he's putting sermons together and programming and, and dreaming up uh, what you guys are gonna do together as a church and where you're gonna go, whenever the worship team is, is deciding on songs and strategies to lead you into a moment of worship, they're never leaving this person out of that equation. They're always thinking about the person that does not know Jesus Christ. They're programming, they're planning, and they're preparing for chair number one. It's the guest of honor chair, right? And again, if that describes you, we just think as a church, it is biblical, it's beautiful, it's brilliant that you're here. We, we, we really think that as, as God's people, that it's that amazing you're here. It takes an unselfish kind of Christ follower to care about that chair. I'll never forget in our very first year as a church, we were meeting in a cheerleading gym, portable church, kind of like you guys do and set up and tear down and all that. And, and this dude started showing up. He was there pretty regularly. And I kind of got to know him a little bit, a real good looking guy, tall guy, you know, looked like he had everything going for him. But I noticed that every time he came, he just reeked of alcohol, like really, really bad. Well, I come to find out, of course, this guy's a raging alcoholic, probably going to die from his alcoholism. It was that bad. Now, when I found that out, since in church, I believe that 
the biblical mandate is anyone can belong. What do you think I did? I'll tell you what I did. Oftentimes he was so drunk, I had to escort him to a chair. And it was always my favorite thing. This is just a by the way deal. It doesn't really matter for the sermon, but to set him down next to the little church lady that like grew up in church, had been there her entire life. And then to watch her face. <laughs> Start smelling. I just loved that, right? And this guy just kept coming to church, kept coming to church for months. And then one day, I remember I had my eyes closed and we're like closing the service, giving people an opportunity to meet Jesus. I had not asked anyone to stand up. They're all sitting like you. And I open my eyes when I say amen. And this dude is just standing and his hands are up and he's just sobbing. I can still see it today. And I realized he had given his life to Christ. And that's what it's all about. Now, here's the real interesting thing. The next week he showed up to church again and he smelled like alcohol again because it doesn't always happen like this, right? It takes time. What did we do? Did we say, all right, bro, now you're a Christian. You got to get off the alcohol or get the heck out of here. They're just like, you don't get to come in smelling like that anymore. No, we just kept loving them. We just kept sitting them next to the little church lady on the front row. Got him in to celebrate recovery, right? And after several months, this guy began to claw his way out of that addiction that was going to kill him. I, I checked on him this week and called and asked if I could share his story. He said, sure, just don't share my name. And uh, he said, by the way, when we got off the phone, he said, by the way, I've been clean for three years now. And I was just, man, I was so pumped. For all believers, we care about that chair the most because it's the chair Jesus cared about the most. But I'm just telling you, there's, there's this thing deep down inside of all of us that will pull us away from that kind of mentality that Jesus had. We're, can we just admit that we struggle with selfishness, right? We struggle to think about others. It's so easy for us to just gravitate towards, towards thinking about ourself. Yet in the scriptures, we're called to be found people who find people, saved people who serve people, right? Changed people who are always working to change people. We've got to do things nobody's doing to reach the people that nobody is reaching. It's your goal as a church to make the entire Lubbock, Texas area the hardest place in the world to go to hell from. So if someone shows up in Lubbock and they're like, hey, how do you get to hell from Lubbock? Someone just has to say, well, you just can't get to hell from Lubbock because City Church is blowing it up. They're doing such a good job, you can't get to hell from Lubbock. That's what your job is as a church. That's what you're here for. That's what's being birthed right now. That's what God's doing. And you can see the proof in it because so many miracles have already happened. I don't know any church plant in the world, and I get to travel and speak all over the place, that has already, at y'all's age, started so many of the things you've started and been a part of so many of the things that you're a part of. God really is doing something special here. Oh, look at verse five, let's jump back in. Here's what he says to the voice, this is Paul. He said, who are you, Lord? And then the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom you're persecuting. And then this phrase always blew my mind. It is hard for you to kick against the goads. That's an interesting phrase, isn't it? To illustrate it, I'd like to bring Pastor Clayton up here and just kick him and I'll show you what it means, right? Do you know what it means, man? This is such an interesting phrase in scripture. Um, this was very common. Yeah, like, wow, he's gonna kick our pastor. We like this guy. This is such a common uh, phrase to see in Greek literature at the time. Uh, what a goad was, was like a, a piece of hardwood um, that a farmer would sharpen down to a point and he'd walk behind the ox and when the ox slowed down, he'd like poke the ox in the heel, kind of like a, their version of a whip. But often the, the, go, the goat or the oxen or whatever they were following would kick against that stick, okay? Making it even worse, right? Now their heels are, are bleeding all over the place and it's based on this one phrase that most biblical scholars agree, Jesus had been following Saul around for years, I mean, Saul was stationed kind of in Jerusalem. Jesus preached in Jerusalem all the time. So, so we can assume that, that Saul had probably heard Jesus preach many, many times. And I think that shows us for chair number one, the seekers in the room, that Jesus is chasing you down. That Jesus loves you so much, he's coming after you. That we all have that need, right? Deep down in our souls, so we try to deny it. We try to think we can make a way into eternity on our own, but we know deep down inside. So we just wanted to say tonight, listen, if that's you, seek your chair and you're like, I'm intensifying my efforts, right? To resist the gospel. I'm only here because my wife made me come tonight or whatever it is. I got a drug problem. She drugged me to church. Okay, whatever it is. We just want you to know if you'll sincerely pursue Jesus, man, you will find what you've been looking for. Look at verse six. 
So he, trembling and astonished, said, Lord, what do you want me to do? And the Lord said to him, arise, go into the city, and you'll be told what you must do. Verse 7. The men with Saul stood speechless, for they heard the sound of someone's voice, but they saw no one. Saul picked himself up off the ground, but when he opened his eyes, he was blind. So his companions led him by the hand to Damascus. Okay, there he remained blind for three days. He did not eat or drink. And the men who journeyed with him stood speechless, hearing a voice again, but seeing no one. Okay, you know how in the movies they'll like, skip over here and show you while this thing was happening that we just showed you there's something else happening simultaneously. That's what scripture is about to do right now. So it says this, now there was a believer in Damascus named Ananias. The Lord spoke to him in a vision calling Ananias. Yes, Lord. He replied. The Lord said, go over to straight street to the house of Judas. And when you get there, ask for a man from Tarsus named Saul. He is praying to me right now. I've shown him a vision of a man named Ananias, that's you, coming in and laying hands on him so he can see again. And then look at Ananias, but Lord. And I wonder how many of us who are Christ followers do that. I wonder how many times we issue our own, but Lord, based off some kind of hang up or something that's deep seated and in our hearts, but maybe not necessarily very Christ-like. But Lord, exclaimed Ananias, I've heard many people talk about the terrible things this man has done to the believers in Jerusalem. And he's authorized, it's like scary Jesus, he's authorized by the leading priests to arrest everyone who calls upon your name. And then the Lord said, go. He's like, I don't care, shut up, go, go, okay? For Saul is my chosen instrument to take my message to the Gentiles and to kings, as well as to the people of Israel. And I will show him how much he must suffer for my name's sake. So Ananias went and he found Saul. Why? Because found people always find people. He laid hands on him and he said, brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road has sent me so that you might regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Instantly something like scales fell from Saul's eyes and he regained his sight. He got up and was baptized. I love how quickly this guy starts taking spiritual steps, right? Afterward, he ate some food and he regained his strength. That blows my mind. He gets baptized. He's calling Jesus Lord. You can see a spiritual shift that is significant happening in Paul's life. What's going on? He is shifting chairs. So he was a seeker. Jesus was chasing him down for years, but listen, God's will for all of us is never to remain a seeker. God's will is that we would shift seats. You got the seeker seat, chair number two, I like to call the beginner chair. The beginner chair. And in a brand new church, there's always a lot of beginning believers. So this, this might be your chair. Remember the question is, which chair is my chair? I want you to figure out which one of these is your chair. I love beginning believers. They're my favorite people in church because they'll cuss at you in the lobby. I love that. Like seriously, that's a measure for whether or not you're reaching people far from God. Pastor, have you been cussed at in the lobby lately? Now, don't just go out and start cussing at them in the lobby, okay? Don't do, y'all don't do that, but, but things like that. I love that. I love how raw their faith is. I love how they're just excited and pumped up, you know? They're not scared. They're ready to charge hell with a water pistol. That's what happens to Saul. He shifts seats from the seeker seat to the beginner seat. And in church, there is always a chair for seekers. There's always a chair for beginners. Always, 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 right? But just know as you come to church that the church, God's people, are here for a reason, to challenge you, to get you to think bigger about your God, right? To get you involved and on mission, to to unlock the gifts God has put inside of you so that the, the, the gospel can advance in this world, in your life and through your life. And the goal for every beginner is to learn, but also to live all that you learn. In Hebrew culture, they did not believe that you had actually learned something unless you were living it. In American culture, we think you've learned something if you talk a big game about it or if you post about it, right? But in Hebrew culture, no, you didn't know something unless you were living that thing. And this is what's happening to Paul. He had to be taught so he could do what God had called him to do. Did you see they had to lead him by the hand? They had to give him something to eat, some spiritual meat, right? Like they, they had to baptize him. They had to feed him. They had to help him take spiritual steps. And so listen, if you're a beginner believer, if you're going, yeah, that's my chair. You don't even have to go any further. Guest pastor from San Antonio, that is me. There's a formula. My brain kind of thinks that way in scripture that can really unlock growth in your life. I want to use some buzzwords here. We, we all have a spiritual gift God has given us. Every one of us, most of us have more than one. And if you'll take your gift and you'll multiply it by a little bit of grind, I'm talking about uh, the, the sanctified sweat that we all need to have, right? If you'll take your gift and, and multiply it by grind, you get growth. 
You get growth. Now, what does grind look like spiritually? That's easy. Worship plus Bible plus giving plus serving. And you don't get to leave any of them out. Worship plus Bible plus giving plus serving. Skip any of those and you are not a fully forming, fully developing, fully submitted to the Lordship of Jesus Christ follower. Worship plus Bible plus serving plus giving. And I'll point out that only one of the four of those has to do with what you know and tuck away right here. And that the other three have to do with what you live with what you activate in your life. Worship Jesus, study Jesus, serve in Jesus's house, give to Jesus through the house, and you absolutely will grow in your relationship with Jesus. And you won't be a beginner for long. Look at what it says next, verse 20. Saul stayed with the believers in Damascus for a few days. Don't miss that. Everybody say a few days. Okay, just a few days. This blows my mind. And immediately he began preaching about Jesus in the synagogues saying he is indeed the son of God and all who heard him were amazed. Do you know what that shows us? One last thought on the beginner chair. You don't have to stay in this one very long. Paul stays in this seat for three days and then shifts to the next seat. And we got Christians today that sit in the beginner chair for 30 years and never do anything with their faith. What an indictment on us. We are called to shift Seats. So here's chair number three. We got the uh, seeker, the beginner. Chair number three, where God wants every Christ follower. This is the reacher, the reacher. This is the seat that God wants every single one of us to develop into at the table as we serve up this big, beautiful biblical meal. Jesus, the bread of life, scripture, the spiritual meat. And look at the healthy biblical ecosystem you see here because you've got seekers, people who don't know Jesus, giving their life to Jesus, becoming beginning believers, beginning believers, growing, unlocking, uh, unlocking their gifts, right? Becoming uh, reachers and reachers going right back out and reaching seekers. In fact, this thing right here, this little picture is the only reason you're even sitting in a church right now. Because for generations before us, people have understood the value of the reacher chair. That the reacher chair is the seat of Christian maturity. And you see this in Saul's life. Saul immediately begins bringing people to Jesus and Jesus to the people. Don't you love that? He just says, yeah, I got a lot to learn, but you know what? People matter more than anything in the world. People are the only thing that I get to take into eternity. And he ends up becoming... I could argue the greatest fisher of men ever. And that's the calling of every Christ follower because Jesus never commanded the unchurched to go to church, but many, many times he commanded the church to go to the unchurched. In fact, y'all maybe heard of the great commission, Matthew chapter 28, verse 19 and 20, big scripture that Christians love to quote, but the great commission, Jesus says that in all four gospels. He doesn't just say it once to us. He says it time and time and time again, that this idea that we're found people who find people so much that we'll even set aside personal preferences in order to reach somebody with the gospel. Amen. This is the chair of people who understand and I almost missed it, except how embarrassing would that be? Oh, that's the guy that fell. Okay. How, how amazing. This, This is the chair of people who understand and accept the mission of Jesus who understand, accept, and and are living out the mission of Christ. And it creates this beautiful biblical thing that we're all called to to be a a, a part of, that that we're all a part of, whether we realize it or not. And the reacher chair, by the way, I gotta just say, is the only other chair in the church. It's the only other chair. Now, people unfortunately assume today, a lot of times in church world, that there is another chair. People in church often assume there's a chair like this. No, pastor, isn't there another chair? And this is where we get people sitting in the beginner chair for 30 years. They're not in the beginner chair, they're in one of these chairs. I call them Christian lounge lizards. Right, just lounging around in this church and they walk in with questions like this. Do I like the music in this Christian lounge? Do I like the food being offered in this Christian lounge? What do I think about the the guy leading the lounge up there on the stage, right? Unfortunately, people think this is a seat, a chair in the church, and it's just not. You don't see it anywhere in the Bible. Another name for it, you don't have to call it the lounge chair, you can call it the eye chair. 
You can call it the I chair, the me chair, the my chair. I want what I want, how I want it. And if I don't get what I want, when I want it, how I want it, I'm leaving. I'm joining the church of the month club, right? And then they just hop and shop. Christian lounge lizarding their way through all these different churches. Listen, here's the job of every Christian and of your pastor is to take this chair and do that. It's to remind you, and this is a reminder I'm trying to give you tonight, if you need it, depending on what chair you're in or what you've always thought about this whole thing, that that chair doesn't exist, that it's not supposed to be in our churches, that that chair is what shuts the church down. Hey, I could put it this way in this building. That chair is the reason this building probably used to be a church and now is an event center. That cuts, doesn't it? But it's probably the truth. We see churches shutting down all over the country today. Thank God he's birthing new churches like you guys and God's doing amazing things. Thank God for that. But I'm telling you that for decades, the reason churches have been closing their doors is this chair right here. And we've got to flip that chair over in our minds. We've got to remind ourselves that chair does not exist. And here's the crazy thing. It's even worse than that, actually, because what happens is people mistake this chair to be the chair of maturity. And this is the chair where people are like, well, I know more about the Bible than those people. Well, Jesus never once commended anyone for knowing more about the Bible than other people. In fact, here's a thought for you. I shouldn't even say this, Pastor Clayton, but I'm going to, and it's going to cause you some conversations. He's like, don't. Here's a thought for you. When Jesus was training up the disciples, they did not have the Bible. Not in the form we have it. Have you ever thought of that? It was a thinking he was trying to teach him and something like this, it was, it was not a part of it. So many people mistake the mature chair for this chair all, all about knowledge. Knowledge is important, right? It's very important that we know God's word, but, but we must live it. Maturity doesn't mean that. Maturity means reaching people. Maturity is the reacher chair. The deepest people are the people reaching people. I used to work out here at Texas Water Rampage. It's one of my first jobs. Good times. I could tell all kinds of stories. That was before I was a Christian, which is why I could tell you really cool stories. Okay. And did you, do you know what I never once saw at Water Rampage? I never saw a rescue happen in the shallow end. Ever. Because if some dude is in the shallow end, I'm drowning. They would just go, stand up. Oh, sorry, right? Rescues only happen in the deep end. You want to go deep in your relationship with Jesus? Get in the deep end and do some rescues. Get in the deep end and radically rescue some people. You can't reach anybody sitting in a lounge chair. You got to get in this reacher chair. Look at, uh, we were having fun before church with this book of the Bible. I grew up in West Texas, so I say Philemon. And Brandon said filet mignon. Okay, filet mignon, chapter one, verse six. I pray that you may be active in sharing your faith so that you will have a full understanding of every good thing we have in Christ. Now, here's something I've learned about God's word a long time ago. Sometimes you can like learn what it's trying to say to you a little bit better if you just sort of read it backwards. So let me read it backwards. Here's what it says backwards. If you want to have a mature understanding, a full understanding of everything that we have in Christ, you have to be active in sharing your faith. If you're not sure if you're in this chair, let me give you a marker. How many people have you led to Christ in the last year? Who in your life are you having a conversation with right now? Or who in your life that's lost are you praying for right now? God, open up a door for the moment. Who are you inviting to this, to City Church right now? See, because that's what we got to be all about. That's a good marker for whether or not you're in this chair of maturity. And to be clear, this chair is not just about like you sacrificing everything and you don't ever get to study the Bible and oh, you can never have any preferences. That's not what it's about. This chair is about your personal growth as well. This chair is about the inner and outer advancement of God's kingdom in your life and also through your life. That's what growth looks like, the inner and outer advancement of God's God's kingdom. And the reacher chair, it is the sweet spot that God wants every Christian in. Stay a soul winner. We are soul winning people with soul winning power. There's no excuses. Every one of us is called to reach people. God, God wants to use you to change the world around you, to change your world. He wants to use you to reach people. It's not just church staff and worship guys and and pastors that lead people to Jesus. And in fact, in Ephesians 4, it tells us that 
the pastors and church staff jobs to equip you to go and reach people for the kingdom of God, for you to go and grow the kingdom. You're a soul winning person. I don't know if you know that or not. You are a soul winning person with soul winning power and you gotta start that soul winning program right now. There is not a single scripture to support the idea that we just attend a church, we sit in a, a lounge chair, but there are many, many, many scriptures, words of Jesus himself that support the idea that you and I are to be the church together and to go out and to reach people. A big, beautiful, biblical ecosystem of people's lives being changed, people being saved, beginning to know Jesus and becoming mature in their faith. Would you bow your head and close your eyes? I want to close like this. I'm going to ask you the question I asked you at the start, which chair is your chair? Would you just talk to God about that for a second? Just say, God, that's my chair and I know it is. What do you want me to do about that? And if you're in the beginner chair, it's easy. It's time to learn and also live out your faith. You got a church of people all around you that love you and are here to help you and grow you. And the really cool thing that happens is you'll, you'll just start to kind of grow together. That's your step if you're in the beginner chair. Baptism, getting in a small group or a Bible study, whatever your church offers to help you get closer to Jesus. Hey, one of the biggest ones, this one has so much power, is serving in a ministry role. When y'all launch these Sunday services, there's gonna be so many things that need to happen to reach people. Stepping into one of those roles, whether it's rocking babies or running sound systems or prepping the room so that people can have an amazing experience like you had the first time you walked in, whatever it is. If you're like, that's me, that's, that's me, that beginner chair. Talk to God about what it is you need to do next, what step you need to take next. If you're in the reacher chair, if you would say, that's me, I think about people who are far from God. My question for you is, who are you gonna reach this summer? The clock is ticking. We never know if we have another day. God's put people in our lives who need us because they need him. What an amazing thing that we get to be a part of that. What a great calling and what an unbelievable responsibility. Going deep is all about the reach. Here's what I'd like to do if that's you, if you're a beginner or a reacher. Meaning if you've given your life to Jesus Christ, here's what I wanna do. I want you to just, as, as you continue to pray, I want you to think right now about someone you know that doesn't know Christ, they don't have a church, or maybe you're just not certain if they do. Right now, names are popping up in your head, faces are popping up in your mind. That is God speaking to you in this very moment through his Holy Spirit, calling you out to go and get that person to love that person, to pray for that person, to pour hope into that person, to share your story with that person, to bring that person right here to church. That's not by accident, that's God. God just gave you a next step. He just gave you a mission. And my prayer for you all week has been that by the end of this summer, you will be active in sharing your faith as we read in the scriptures so that you can have a full understanding of the goodness of God. And listen, chair number one, as you continue to just talk to God for a second, if that resonated with you, if you're like, that's me, I'm just not sure if I believe yet. Second Corinthians six says that today is the day of salvation. That's some of the best news you could ever hear because what it indicates is that you don't have to have grown up in church and you don't have to be free from addiction and you don't have to have this perfect looking holy life. You don't have to have a great church attendance record. You don't have to go to some class. Today's the day of salvation. You can cross the line of faith right now. You can shift seats. You can get out of the seeker chair, on a knee, give your life to Christ and you will be in that beginner chair. The gospel's simple. God came down, he left heaven for us in the person of Jesus. Sinners are saved. Every one of us falls short of God's glorious standard. None of us can make a way to heaven on our own. Even on our best day, we're like filthy rags. Hurts are healed. He doesn't just take care of heaven. He wants to intervene and be a part of every single thing that we face right here, right now. 
Jesus said in John 10, 10, he came to give eternal life, but also abundant life. God came down, sinners are saved, hurts are healed, and last, humans have hope. That's the gospel. If you're chair number one, that seeker chair, do you have hope? What is your hope in? Because my prayer for you has been this entire week that you would give your life to Christ, that you would just say, that's it. Jesus said, it doesn't take a lot of faith, faith of a mustard seed. A simple willingness to accept a free gift that's actually already yours. On the cross, he said, it is finished. The question is not, can you have the free gift of salvation? The question is not, can you get to heaven? The question is, will you open up the free gift? Will you open it and accept it into your heart? We'd like to lead you in a prayer, an opportunity to do that right now. These are not magical words. They don't do anything by themselves, but God sees your heart. He sees your soul. He knows what's going on in there. Hey, City Church, let's all pray this out loud together so no one stands alone. Would you repeat after me? Jesus, I give you my life. I surrender all to you. You are Lord. You are Savior. I repent. I turn from my sin to you. Thank you for the cross. Thank you for conquering death that I might have life. Make me a brand new person. In Jesus' name. Amen. Let's make some noise. Let's worship loud for anyone who just gave their life to Christ for what God's doing here. Come on, make some noise. Come on, like you mean it. Come on, God's doing something amazing here. Get on your feet. Get on your feet if you believe it. And let's worship together.